Uh, our first speaker uh, is Lori Balfour from the University of Virginia, who will be presenting a paper entitled Tony Morrison's Word Work as uh, a Practice of Freedom. Uh, Lori Balfour is Professor of Politics at, uh, at the University of Virginia, in which, uh, among many books, uh, Balfour is uh, the author of Democracy and Reconstruction, Reconstruction, Thinking Politically with W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, and The Evidence of Things Not Said, James Baldwin, uh, and The Promise of American Democracy. And Balfour has written several articles on democracy and democratization, uh, race and gender, uh, and is currently the editor, editor of the journal Political Theory. Uh, and on the personal note, has been the subject of many drafts and versions of my work from when I was a uh, um, uh, graduate student. Uh, and, and I have consistently not only benefited uh, from, uh, from that dialogue, but also uh, mentorship in the field. You know there's persons where even if they're not at your institution, seem to always want to um, offer uh, guidance, though many other people are doing the same thing too in different ways. And, and, and so I just want to say I really uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, our second speaker will be uh, uh, Professor John Drabinsky from Amherst College, uh, who will be uh, presenting on vernacular culture and the question of belonging. Uh, John Drabinsky is the Charles Hamilton Houston 1915 Professor of Black Studies at Amherst College, uh, and his teaching and research focuses on uh, a wide variety of areas, not only uh, Caribbean and African American intellectual traditions, uh, but also uh, French and Francophone uh, critical theory and philosophy. Uh, he is the author of four books, uh, among which uh, is uh, just out. I mean, I have to see the digital version. In, in a month, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic book, Abyssal Beginnings. Uh, Glissant <laughs> Philosophy in the Middle uh, Middle Pass. Yeah, that's right. They kind of amended it. Glissant in the Middle Pass. Glissant in the Middle Pass. It's the first major study of Edward Glissant's thought uh, and philosophy in the intersection of philosophy and black studies. Uh, and it is a fantastic read. Uh, in addition to the prize winning book, uh, Letting Us and the Post Colonial Race, Nation, and, uh, and Other. And with regards to kind of Berkshire kind of county, someone who in terms of not only intellectual in terms of black studies and, and, and political theory, but also in terms of family and, uh, and young ones who are in the same age orbit, uh, has been someone who is constantly dialogued with both in academia and on the, on the playground. Um, uh, and our final uh, speaker uh, is Professor Keisha Khan Perry from Brown University, uh, who will be presenting on the black feminist struggle uh, for social democracy uh, in, uh, uh, in Brazil. Professor Perry is Associate Professor of Africana Studies uh, at Brown University, my alma mater, uh, in which she specializes in, among er various areas in the critical study of race, gender, and politics in the Americas, with a focus on black women's activism, urban geography, and questions of citizenship, feminist theories, uh, and, uh, the, and intellectual uh, history. Uh, she is the author of several articles, book chapters, uh, and among uh, her books is the prize-winning work, uh, Black Women Against the Land Grab, The Fight for uh, Racial Justice in uh, Brazil, which is an ethnographic study of black women's activism uh, in Brazilian cities. And we are both a member of the uh, Jamaican diaspora in the northeast of the United States. And so um, I can always say thanks for that. So I will turn it over to um, Professor Dawkins. Um, so I want to begin, um, as others have, um, inadequately but sincerely to thank Neil for the invitation and for, I would say, many, many decades of mentorship to me and, um, and also to thank Veronica and Carrie for making this so easy and even though Neil tried to take credit uh, for arranging the weather, um, <laughs> so it's been, been wonderful. So this piece is part of a book project um, that uh, tries to think through the idea of freedom in many different ways in which um, Toni Morrison works through the idea of freedom uh, across her body of work. The first piece in Toni Morrison's newest nonfiction collection is entitled Peril. Clearly, Morrison's warning against the threat of regimes that censor, harass, or exile writers speaks directly to our current condition. Yet she wrote it more than 10 years ago when she received the Penn Borders Literary Service Award. 
And the speech sounds a note that runs through her nonfiction prose from the 1970s to 2019. She appeals to her fellow writers to protect each other against authoritarian encroachment and to persist in doing the work that is distinctly theirs, to use their imaginative gifts to translate trauma, cruelty, and exploitation into a shareable language. Freedom for Morrison is enacted through language, through the imagination of lives that have been lost to official history and worlds that are not yet in existence but might be. Yet a relationship to the words with which she plots paths to freedom is double-edged. Language is liberating and imprisoning, plastic and resistant. It is open to the creation of new meanings and it always carries with it the sedimentation of racist ideas and assumptions. Morrison approaches these challenges as someone who considers herself both a reader and a writer, who attunes her audience to the harms inflicted by the wrong words and the impossibility of escaping the operations of racism and sexism simply by choosing the right ones. She takes that impossibility as a spur to creation. Her aim is to conjure situations in which racial categories retain their historical specificity, but not their capacity to murder. At the same time, she takes responsibility for safeguarding the values and aesthetic traditions of black communities, recreating stories of black lives that have been dismissed and discredited by the gatekeepers of American literary tradition, and a saying, in her words, to transfigure the complexity and wealth of Afro-American culture into a language worthy of the culture. Morrison's 11 novels constitute an extended inquiry into the lived meanings of freedom through the lives of black women, men, and children. Today, however, I focus on ways that her nonfiction prose deepens our understanding of how to connect freedom with the work of words. I begin by examining her ambivalent relationship to American English as someone who seeks new forms of truth-telling in the master's tongue. Reading Morrison in conjunction with anti- and post-colonial thinkers such as Gugi Watiango, Aimé Césaire, and Franz Fanon accentuates how she wrestles with questions of racial, racial power, aesthetics, and linguistic inheritance from the vantage of enslaved and colonized subjects. Although Morrison emphasizes that language, image, and experience are, quote, the resources available to, to us for benign access to each other, she dwells with equal care on the ways that the godlings of language and image have been potent tools of dis repression, dispossession, and the effacement of human personality. She asserts that eliminating the potency of racist constructs in language is a work that I can do, close quote but she acknowledges that she can never slip that yoke entirely. So she searches for words that will enable her, enable her to remain faithful to people and places that have never been fully incorporated into a national literature or the nation state, which is not to say that they have escaped its police powers. Morrison is exquisitely aware that there's no clear route from bondage to freedom that can be realized through printed words and genres that are politically and aesthetically powerful in one era cannot simply be reproduced unaltered for the purposes of another. The novel, she writes, is needed by African Americans because it does work that myths and archetypal stories once performed when they were more fully embedded in the life of black communities. Her account of the necessity of a literary genre in the lives of people for whom it was not originally intended speaks to entwined art artistic and political commitments. The novel may function, as Madhu Dubey argues, as a form of compensation for a disappearing oral tradition. Yet it matters to Morrison because it is a form in which she can experiment with what she calls this extraordinary language. The language used by black people, which she calls the metaphors and perceptions that came out of that world. In claiming the novel as an element of communal life, Morrison echoes Ngugi's question in decolonizing the mind. Why should not the African peasants and working class appropriate the novel? Although she doesn't follow his lead in bidding farewell to English, Morrison's account of the distinctive wordcraft and rhythms of black English resonates with Ngugi's conviction that, quote, language has a suggestive power well beyond the immediate and lexical meaning. He recalls how his appreciation of the suggestive magical power of language was reinforced by the games we played with words through riddles, 
proverbs, transpositions of syllables, or through nonsensical but mu musically arranged words. By alchemizing American English into a language capacious enough to articulate the complexity of black experiences, Morrison shares the aspiration of others who have tried to transform a tool of unfreedom into a medium for emancipation. In this sense, her account of manipulating, and that's her word, the language of her birth echoes Césaire's comments about the anti-colonial work of writing. While acknowledging his formation in French language and its influence on his thinking and writing, he remarks that he wanted, quote, to create an Antillean French, a black French that while still being French had a black character. For Morrison, this kind of project involves attunement to the rhythms and cadences of African American communities, both li linguistic and otherwise, and the careful presentation of ideas and information that, she says, have been dismissed as lore or gossip or magic or sentiment by the gatekeepers of white culture. Like Césaire, she seeks alternative to reductionist forms of expression, language stripped down to the facts that disguise the more complex human realities of human life. Her work also demands that she recognize and refuse the false offers through which black subjects are either fixed in their subordination or become fluent in what she calls the language of the rescued. So what alternative is there to the always and already raced writer who refuses to speak in the language of the rescued and incur its debts? One of the marks of her writing is its inventive approach to the degraded images that pervade American representations of black life. Where Fanon repudiates the colonizer's insistence that the black man has to wear the livery that the white man has made for him, Morrison often takes the racist, sexist associations that saturate U.S. culture as a starting point. Her response to subjugation by language is to pry open those images, to disclose alternative interpretations and complicate histories that flatten the truth. She explains that in her practice as a fiction writer, she begins from an image or a shard of memory in order to unlock the complex interior dimensions of lives conventionally rendered as mere surface, or reduced to types. In her remaking of English language to suit new purposes, she refuses to explain or to vindicate African American life. So how does she do this work? In a 1997 essay on home, Morrison declares that she cannot wait for the ultimate liberation theory to imagine its practice and do its work. But she also makes a striking, and I imagine in this particular setting, um, puzzling move. She invokes the language of sovereignty to convey what fiction writing offers her in a world in which language is structured by racism. Indeed, Morrison returns to this vexed terminology repeatedly across her career. By emphasizing what she calls racial specificity minus racial hierarchy, sorry, racial specificity minus racist hierarchy in her figurative choices, she yearns to control racial categories, to use them, subvert them, eliminate them in her own way, even though she also always acknowledges the false promise of that desire. In a 1992 interview with Paris Review, for instance, she recounts how writing, more than any other dimension of life, enables her to respond to the incredible violence, the willful ignorance, the hunger for other people's pain that shaped the world. Writing becomes a form of belonging, she says, insofar as it allows her to gather the contradictory elements of history and experience into a kind of order. Even if you are reproducing the order, Morrison explains, you are sovereign. And at moments she goes even further. So when she concludes a 1981 address to the American Writers Conference, she proclaims, we must be sovereign. Morrison's emphasis on an idea of sovereignty and its place of prominence in her reflections on the question of how as a writer she reaches for ways to be both free and situated is striking in at least three respects. First, there's nothing casual or accidental about its appearance. Her career is a testament to the weightiness of word choice, both in her novels and her nonfiction. She is particularly attuned to the aesthetic and political pitfalls of using words that stifle insurrection, that minstrelize or that offer solace to the powerful, or that obscure truth she aims to tell. Second, Morrison's excavations of American literary tradition, white American literary tradition, disclose the degree to which white writers have asserted their own sovereignty through distorted, 
and often unacknowledged figurations of Africans and people of African descent. Her fiction and her nonfiction track the ways in which European settlers in North America and their white heirs have projected fears and anxieties onto non-white women and men so as to create a sense of order out of chaos, precisely what she sees herself as doing as a kind of counterpractice in her fiction writing. Third, of course, the, word, uh, the choice of a word that denotes either the mastery of the individual over her or himself or the exercise of state power seems to misdescribe her own practice as a novelist. For Morrison maintains that the liberatory work of words must always exceed the grip of the author as a solitary creator on the one hand, and she refuses the comforts of identification with the nation on the other. So the, the puzzle is this um, recurrence of this language of sovereignty even as she offers such a powerful critique of conventional ways of understanding uh, sovereign power. So what place could this idea have in an activity that always depends on what Morrison calls the active complicity of a reader willing to step outside the boundaries of the racial imaginary? Why would a novelist who is more acutely aware than most of the operations of sovereignty as, and here I quote Mbembe, the power and capacity to dictate who may live and who must die, reach for a term that is so regal in its prerogative? Morrison provides an indirect response in Unspeakable Things Unspoken, her 1988 Tanner lectures. There, she explores three converging issues, battles over the status and scope of the American literary canon, the ways in which race inflects or informs the work of white authors who do not acknowledge its presence, um, and, and the third is the arduous responsibility of bringing black experiences to life on the printed page. To address the last of these questions, Morrison turns a critical eye to the opening sentences of her own novels, devoting a section to each of the five books that had appeared at the time. As she reviews her words as a writer and a reader, she considers her aspirations, her strategies, and her dissatisfaction with the results. Writerly sovereignty, in Morrison's view, is a way of making sense out of chaos. In lieu of responding with violence, the writer has a capacity for what she calls stillness. And this is something that comes out in some of her more recent work and then is part of that first um, essay in the new volume. And I think that there's something, I haven't really thought this through, but I've been thinking about um, <coughs> Kwashi's idea of the sovereignty of, qu of quiet um, in conjunction with Morrison on, on stillness. She captures this idea in Unspeakable Things Unspoken in her reflections on her first novel, The Bluest Eye and on her efforts to bend the language to her own purposes. Morrison addresses the fraught responsibilities of, of describing the disintegration of the central character, 11-year-old Pecola Breedlove, Breedlove, who prays for blue eyes to make her own ugly ones disappear, and who is, in the narrator's words, having her father's baby. To provide a workable beginning for the bluest eye, Morrison uses straightforward, simple language, an opening phrase that recalls the storytelling practices of her childhood and then engages the reader in what she calls conspiracy. She tries, in her words, to shape a silence while breaking it. And here's how she talks about this choice. And I wish there was a way for you to see how many parentheses there are in this um, passage. My choice of language, speakerly, oral, colloquial. My reliance for full comprehension on codes embedded in black culture. My effort to efface immediate co-conspiracy and intimacy without any distancing explanatory fabric, as well as my failed attempt to shape a silence while breaking it, are attempts, many unsatisfactory, to transfigure <coughs> the complexity and wealth of Afro-American culture into a language worthy of the culture. Morrison's approach to fiction writing stretches the capacity of the language of her inheritance to enable meditations on forms of illegitimate power that have been largely disregarded and unredressed. This is not a flight from finitude, as some critics of sovereignty contend, but an effort to find freedom through finitude by dwelling on human vulnerabilities and risking failure. Morrison is only too aware of the hazards of placing the burdens of disclosure on a character as fragile and as broken as Bacola, and yet she writes. 
In doing so, she cautions against how Pecola's life can, can be, and here I'm quoting Sadia Hartman, made useful or instructive by finding in it a lesson for our future or a hope for history. Rather, she undertakes what Hartman calls writing the impossible. Without denying the risks of aligning sovereignty and freedom, Morrison's work gestures towards possibilities other than state power and individual mastery. Her assertion of authorial power is necessarily incomplete, both because it requires the participation of the reader and because the lethal operations of racist language continually shadow her own efforts to imagine ways of living in which black lives really matter, concretely, aesthetically, and philosophically. Like indigenous writers and activists, Morrison discredits the view that all forms of sovereignty are equally hazardous and inquires whether critiques of sovereignty are the preserve of the privileged. Morrison experiments with practices of freedom in face of the ongoing dispossession and domination of racially marked populations. And in light of her insistence on the co-origination of American democracy and the subjugation of non-white subjects, her deep care for the lives of the enslaved, the removed, the displaced, and their descendants. Her writing cautions to consider the implications of calls for renewal or revitalization of American democracy, and her struggle to manipulate American English to excavate untold stories um, of racialized experience without reinforcing racist assumptions offers no simple lessons. Instead, she seeks to offer what she calls a map through narratives that permit criticism of both rebellion and tradition. Now, I don't know if this may be what Diva means by prag pragmatism. So she's, she's wary of both rebellion and tradition as confining in some senses and wanted to think um, new futures that, that actually that can be realized in the way that midnight baking and the, the home, homemaking um, might do. She also invites the reader to participate in collaborative creation. Her 1993 Nobel lecture vivifies this uh, idea by telling a story about language that simultaneously ruminates on its abuses and possibilities, exposes the betrayal of wisdom by authority, and celebrates the beauty of narration as a collective venture. It begins with a story. Once upon a time, there was an old woman, blind but wise. This woman is assailed by a group of young people who taunt her with the intention of piercing the aura of wisdom they believe she has not earned. After recounting how the visitors press the old woman to tell them whether the bird they are holding in hand she cannot see is alive or dead, Morrison says that she views the woman as a writer. The bird in her telling is language, which the woman thinks of, quote, partly as a system, partly as a living thing over which one has control, but mostly as agency. An, as an act with consequences. Morrison devotes much of the lecture to an examination of the old woman's unspoken thoughts about the violence that is done to language by, the heads, of, by heads of state, corporate leaders, academics, patriots, and others, and by language, which often serves to silence or to kill. The lecture offers eloquent testimony to the generative power of word work and to the urgency of wielding that power with care for the lives it destroys or elevates. But Morrison doesn't stop there. Midway through the lecture, she begins again. Once upon a time, visitors ask an old woman a question. This time, Morrison remarks that perhaps the young people simply wanted to be heard, to have their bafflement about the world taken seriously, and to receive the woman's consideration rather than the disapproval her silence implies. The entreaty transfigures their questions into a story of their own, a story about a slave ship turned away from the shore and an encounter of a pair of children with a wagon full of slaves en route to an unnamed destination. When their story ends, the old woman speaks again, marveling at the beauty of what she calls this thing we have done together. Whether we read the old woman's silence in the face of her visitor's question as a form of coercion or manipulation, or we choose to see it as a form of pedagogy enacted by someone with the wisdom to know that the young people will find their way without her imposition of, of a path, Morrison gives her audiences something other than the ultimate liberation theory. She intimates how the practice of creating stories with words enables new form of connection in the face of ongoing and imminent catastrophe. Morrison's efforts to remake the vexed terms of her inheritance in fiction 
and to meditate on that practice in speeches and essays exemplifies a persistent and perpetually incomplete ambition to connect the actual and the possible. She reorients uh, readers away from what she calls the dreamscape of worlds in which the unmattering of race happens through evasion or through fluency in the language of the dominant culture and undertakes the kinds of intimate acts of imagination and possibly repair that are available to her as a writer who cannot disremember the legacies of the slave trade, slavery, and colonialism or avert her eyes from their afterlives. If she focuses on the peril facing writers, her words also remind her readers that our freedom is at stake in the ongoing cultivation of literary art. As she observes at the end of Unspeakable Things Unspoken, all necks are on the line. Thank you. That was a great paper, um, really was. Um, so, uh, you know, to reiterate, all the thanks to everyone uh, who uh, funded, did details, printed things, proofread for the day. Um, I'll add my thanks to that. You know, it's, um, there's nothing like April for those of us not on sabbatical to remind oh us God. that what we do uh, is a job, <laughs> which means, um, contractual obligations and maybe a heavy dose of hating it. So um, I especially uh, welcome the opportunity to stand, uh, sit in a room and talk and listen and think for a day. I think it's actually a really special thing. It's uh, probably what drew most of us into uh, this kind of life. So anyway, <clears throat> my remarks today revolve around what is to me a central issue in reckoning with the African American intellectual tradition. The relationship and the tradition between cultural production and the politics of belonging. At the heart of this relationship is the matter of integration, broadly conceived, into a wider multiracial political and social space. This is no simple equation. I am mindful always of James Baldwin's question in The Fire Next Time, do I really want to be integrated into a burning house? Baldwin's remark is less about the, a nascent nationalism on his part, of course, and more about an affirmation of the meaningfulness of black life in the liminal space of the United States. What do we do with that meaningfulness? And how does it relate to the significance and power of vernacular culture as a kind of belonging that does not need or perhaps even want wider social and political inclusion? Let me begin with a few comments on the trajectory of Paul Gilroy's work work that crystallizes many of the key theoretical meta-issues in the African-American tradition. Gilroy's oeuvre moves in two distinct directions. These directions schematize the stakes of thinking through black cultural production and politics. First, there is the argument in the Black Atlantic for establishing the African-American tradition as a form of counter-modernity. This argument establishes the roots and roots of that tradition. But the wider theoretical problem of modernity is transformed in Gilroy's hands. Rather than thinking the tradition as abject or produced as a reactive force, Gilroy demonstrates the incisive and unique character of African American cultural production inside white European modernity, a counter modernity insofar as it operates under the rubric time and geography of white European modernity, unique and incisive insofar as it moves outside the hegemony of the latter through hypersyncretic and creolizing work. Second, there's the argument, more utopian than anything, in his post-2000 essays that move against racial nationalism and toward a vision of conviviality. The Black Atlantic, with its, with its emphasis on the labor of producing the cultural forms of counter-modernity, is already a critique of racial nationalism. Roots and roots are post-national and syncretic, but in between camps, post-colonial post melancholia and after, Gilroy expo explores these possibilities, the, sorry, explores the possibilities, conditions, and hopes for conviviality, that living together that is conceivable after all the discourses that dominated modernity, race, nation, ethno-nationalism, and cultural specificity. Conviviality is a relation of exchange and pleasure. Less the much hyped and often maligned post-racial world, more the material factuality of multicultural space made to its own measure. A humanism after the infrahuman, we could say. <clears throat> 
Gilroy's theorization of the past, then future of black life raises important questions. Let me here posit a guiding question for my reflections. Pending the social and political transformation that makes conviviality possible, what are we to make of the cultural space cleared out by countermodern production and questions of belonging? For me, this is a key question in thinking through the meaning of democracy in an anti-black necropolitical world. That is, if the production of social death is the political transcendental, the condition for the possibility of making American, uh, the American commonplace in which black death is commonplace, then how ought we think belonging and democratic meaning? In a certain sense, this is an old question. I would say it is at the heart of one of the founding disputes in the African American tradition, the clash uh, of political vision between W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. That dispute is at first glance about the ethics and politics of concession. But that is to let Du Bois dictate the terms of the dispute. For Du Bois, Washington's focus on Tuskegee and vocational education comes to its political fruition in the Atlanta Compromise. In that moment, Washington tells the white South that he will not demand civil rights and will instead focus on the cultivation of virtues, work ethic, political sensibilities, democratic commitment, and other American spiritual values until the timing is right for integration. Du Bois contests this with virulent language in the third chapter of Souls of Black Folk depicting Washington as the worst kind of black person who was happy to accept the white South's vision of abject blackness. Washington's argument in Up From Slavery, however, gives a very different account of his own rationale. On Washington's account, the Tuskegee Project is really about making black life whole after two and a half centuries of brokenness. This is a project about work and virtue that is in many ways paralleled in Anna Julia Cooper's conception of womanhood in A Voice From the South in which she argues that black women need their femininity recognized and from that recognition come to reform black childhood and manhood with the virtues and values denied them for centuries. Writing from the recently emancipated uh, South, a site in which black people had to live alongside their torturers and enslavers after emancipation, Washington and Cooper both turned their gaze and labor back to rebuilding or building for the first time, perhaps, African-American subjectivity as cultivation of self. Du Bois, the child of the abolitionist hotbed of the Berkshires and New England more broadly, does not see this struggle and demand. He sees only concession. But if we read Washington and Cooper in the frame of this living alongside torturers and enslavers, then I wonder if a different picture comes into view, a picture moving from survival to self-making. This requires a double reading of sorts. In particular, I have in mind just this. Washington, and perhaps Cooper, is advocating in the higher frequencies for concessions to white racism and its sense of racial supremacy. But what of the lower frequencies? What is the second moment folded into compromise? Perhaps those lower frequencies tell a different story, a story uh, about what it means to live in such violent contested space and want to not just survive, but begin to thrive. Who will be our lawyers, accountants, farmers, teachers, doctors, and business owners in the uh, post-reconstruction nation, Washington asks, black people. This is Washington's emphatic claim. When he makes this claim, we ought to hear in it a kind of racial nationalism, black people for black people, African American community for itself, not for another, not in the interest of another, nor under the gaze of the other. To be sure, there is a lot in Up From Slavery and elsewhere about an integration to come, when African Americans prove themselves worthy, Washington claims, white Southerners will recognize black goodness, equality, and even greatness. But before that, there is a retreat of blackness and black people into itself in the economic and full social sense. Tuskegee produces just this, a sort of post-emancipation maronage. Try to use a word from <laughs> our host. I'm often struck by how this early dispute prefigures so much that follows, especially in terms of the persistence of pessimism as an affect across the tradition. So we'll go back a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. Neil. <laughs> for all of his critique of Washington and aspiration for a different kind of America, it remains critical that we remember how Du Bois' work and life took such a decidedly pessimistic turn, beginning in dark water, I'm thinking in particular of the Souls of White Folk chapter, and culminating in his renunciation of U.S. citizenship and emigration to Ghana. Uh, 
I also have in mind Richard Wright's work from Native Son onward, for which the movement from nearly always abject black life into integrated social and political space is figured as the movement from muted life to violent premature death. The man who lived underground exits the underground only to be murdered by the state. This is a short story, The Man Who Lived Underground. And we all know Bigger Thomas's fate. It's the same. Wright puts the pessimist ontology of whiteness into literary nihilism, which is a kind of race realism. When Ralph Ellison critiques Wright's fiction as mere sociology in the world and the jug, it is important to note how that is an aesthetic intervention. The pessimism remains beyond dispute. Against this pessimism, there is in the tradition what we could call, or I, I will call following Michael Snedeker, who uses it in a different context, uh, queer optimism. Not the optimism of a belief in American ideals. The necropolitical order makes such things perversely utopian in a certain view, as well as derived from a misappropriation of founding principles and promises. Rather, there is instead an anchoring of life in sites of casual resistance culture, pleasure, love, sadness, suffering, ecstasy, celebration. Not those things in mixed spaces or spaces, space or spaces, but as the defining features of black life lived answering only to itself, or what Baldwin in Many Thousands Gone calls, quote, the relationship that Negroes bear to one another. This is Baldwin, to my mind, Baldwin's most powerful repudiation of Wright's nihilism. In it, he asks, what would it mean to think from this relation rather than from the labor of the white gaze and its life world? It would mean taking the tradition, the African-American tradition, seriously as an event of world making, the appropriation of thought and being by the work of intra-racial relations and their form of belonging. In a simple phrase, this is life as what, following so much of what Ellison's essays had argued, Albert Murray calls the blues aesthetic. The blues, Alice Ellison writes, is an impulse to keep the painful details and episodes of a brutal experience alive in one's aching consciousness, to finger its jag jagged grain, and to transcend it, not by the consolation of philosophy, but by squeezing from it a near tragic, near comic lyricism." End of quote. It's beautiful. This is world-making work. Murray makes this clear when he writes, quote, when the Negro musician or dancer swings the blues, he is fulfilling the same fundamental existential requirement that determines the mission of the poet, the priest, and the medicine man." End of quote. I love Albert Murray. <laughs> it's just amazing. Creation of worlds, the naming of what is holy, and the terms of participation in worship. The blues as aesthetic as subjectivity and also community. If we take the blues aesthetic seriously, then we begin to see how the spatial meaning of belonging is always and already fraught, or at least complicated. That is, belonging on the model of Gilroy's conviviality is about the transformation of the psychological, cultural, social, and political space of a broad public, transformation of that into a space of multicultural participation and indulgence, and if you spend any time with Paul, he will give you endless details of his neighborhood to, <laughs> to uh, demonstrate this space. Conviviality is about the pleasures of being together, friendship as the possibility of another kind of polis. Conciliation, making friendship for the first time, not reconciliation, and humanism reconfigured in Césaire's words as a measure fitted to the world. These gather the full ethical and political meaning of conviviality to itself, animating it with the vision of the human after the infrahuman. The spatiality of this project or vision is the broadest sense of the polis and committed to common places, sites that bring multicultural communities together. We can see this sort of thing, uh, this sort of vision manifest in discrete places. For example, the jazz club in Baldwin's Another Country and Sonny's Blues, in which new forms of racial sociality are possible. Gilroy writes Baldwin's jazz club large. This is the politics of a new humanism. But another spatiality needs words and attunement. The spatiality enacted in the liminal spaces of black sociality outside the white gaze. The white gaze is a mythic figure, and at least in part, rightly so. The mythic character of the white gaze lies in its alleged and sometimes real 
capacity to form and deform social ontology, generating a colonial social and political space in which black possibility is determined by the anti-black values of that gaze. Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks is an exemplary text here, precisely because it outlines with such phenomenological and existential rigor how sociogeny determines ontology and all, pessimis, all the pessimism and apocalyptic thinking that flows from such determination under colonial regimes. But what of the sociality that is not beholden to that gaze? If we recall Baldwin's early critique of right, in particular when that critique works through the figures of Uncle Tom and Aunt Jemima, we can see a key shift in psychological and cultural space. Baldwin attacks right by arguing that his protagonists are simply create the creations of white racism. That's totally unfair if you ask me, but that's his critique. The protagonists are not in any sense fully developed African American subjects. His protagonists are like Uncle Tom and Aunt Jemima, understood in their most reduced senses, as objects of white racism and not subjects of their own lives. Right is not wrong, of course. Baldwin famously notes that every black person has a bigger Thomas living inside their skull. But Baldwin also asks what it means that we have not contemplated or stopped to imagine the whispers between Tom and Jemima. We have not considered their dreams and fantasies. We have not thought their lives without aunt and uncle, those two derisive qualifiers. What about Jemima and Tom? Who are they? What do they have to say to us? What of their lives remains unsaid? Aunt Jemima and Uncle Tom, Baldwin writes, our creations at the last evaded us. They had a life their own, perhaps a better life than ours, and they would never tell us what it was, end of quote. Or perhaps better, we struggle to listen and hear that life. It is a life without articulation in Stowe, for sure, but also in Wright's fiction, which Baldwin describes as her great inheritor. I think it's always worth noting that Wright's uh, nonfiction tells a really different story. Um, I really would love to know what James Baldwin thought of Wright's nonfiction. If we begin with those whispers and dreams, Baldwin claims, then we open ourselves to what has already happened, and indeed what makes Wright himself possible. Recall here Ellison's remarks, remark that, quote, Wright could imagine bigger, but bigger could not possibly imagine Richard Wright, end of quote. But the key point is that this imagining and making has already happened, the bit that makes right possible. And it is not what the white gaze configures as the possibilities for blackness. Indeed, or instead, it is the formation in and of vernacular culture, something as old as the arrival on and leaky space of the plantation, something as new as the conversations and creations outside or in the folds of the sociogenies shared uh, of shared multiracial political space. This alternative liminal space may be narrow and limited if viewed from the perspective of conviviality and its humanist aspirations. But seen from itself as the blues aesthetic and all the developments that have flowed from it, it is an entire world. And this for me is the crucial insight to be drawn from thinkers like Baldwin, Ellison, Murray, and others. The project of world making is not just a matter of survival, fiat or abject clinging to what remains. Rather, it is just that, making a world. In the end, then, I would argue that conviviality, for all of its rich insight and profound moral aspirations, is in very real tensions with the implications of the world-making work of counter-modernity. Counter-modernity is in many ways the refusal of the center margin dyad, and the sorts of political imperatives, conservative and radical both, that derive from it. The reinscription of that dyad in theorizing a wider sense of democracy and democratic belonging makes sense. The marginal always move in the world of the center, as it were, whereas the marginal are, at best, abandoned, subject to violence and terror at the worst. My question in these moments, in these contrasting and at times crossing spaces, comes back to the meaning of belonging and vernacular culture. If vernacular culture is not only a belonging of black life to itself, but also a world sufficient to the task of sustaining and growing that life, right? creating Richard Wright. The blues aesthetic becomes the jazz aesthetic, becomes soul babies and hip hop culture. Then what is lost in the movement to conviviality? 
What is the fate of the countermodern in another convivial modernity and its aftermath? This has been the hesitation of Washington, Cooper, and others in the tradition, manifest then as the question of civil rights and black independence. Their hesitation returns here and asks us simply to contemplate the risks of vernacular culture and belonging when we think race into democracy's promise of, commonplace, of a commonplace of friendship, conviviality, and the widest sense of belonging. What does it mean to lose a world in search of another future? Thanks. time I was setting my watch, I saw that um, there was some mishap at the birthday party, but I won't pay attention to that, so <laughs> I am here. Um, first, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I recognize, so, thank you. I recognize and respect the indigenous peoples um, who have stewarded the lands on which Williams College um, currently resides. Um, and second, I would like to thank Neil Roberts for this invitation um, and Veronica Botsley for planning this event. I'm honored to be in the company of such great scholars, um, especially uh, Michael Hanchard, whose book Orpheus in Power, the Movimiento Negro of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, 1945 to 19, 1988, shaped my research trajectory. In fact, I would say he gave me my dissertation project, and just five minutes ago, he gave me um, a couple of other book projects. So, um, <laughs> I'm grateful for that as well as Marisa Fuentes and Angela, um, Angelica um, Bernal, and among others. Um, I'm delighted to learn more about your work. It's wonderful to be here. Um, um, and like John, the, the opportunity to, to stop and think um, is really important. Trezentos e noventa e nove dias, 395 days. Each morning, Brazilian journalist Eliane Brum and social activist Monica Benicio remind us of the amount of days that have passed since the assassination of black queer Rio de Janeiro activist and councilwoman from the Maria neighborhood, Marielle Franco, and her driver, Anderson Silva. Franco was killed minutes after leaving an event focused on the empowerment of black women and girls, an event live streamed on Facebook. Almost 200 politicians, mostly left-leaning, and activists, black and indigenous, mostly fighting against territorial loss, have been killed in the last five years in Brazil. And many of these cases remain unsolved. With the recent arrest of two former police officers, with direct ties to the current um, Brazilian president, Jair, um, Jair Bolsonaro, the question of King Matou, or who killed Marielle, may have been answered, but the question of King Mando Mata, or who ordered her killing, and por que, why, remains a, a mystery. In the days leading up to the Brazilian presidential elections of, of October 2018, Broom also published um, the essay in El País entitled O Odio um, de Todo Meu Diva, or loosely translated to mean Hate Sat on My Couch. She begins the essay with the narration of the re real life uh, experience of the psychoanalyst uh, Silvia Belen um, Belintani with, her, uh, with his 19 year old gay male client. Um, and I, I'll read the English version. He enters without saying a word and starts to cry right away. I asked him what happened and he said, frightened, that he was approached by a guy at the university with the following words. He, here they, and he uses the F word. Um, have you seen the research or, um, or the surveys? Take advantage of the days until the, uh, um, until the 28th, referring to the elections, to walk holding hands because when Me Too, referring to Bolsonaro, assumes power, he'll end this nonsense and you'll be beaten until you turn into a man. Hmm. Belin Belintani writes of another client, a 17-year-old feminist, who told her of how just before the election she had been threatened with violence. Someone left a note in her book at school that stated, um, achou mesmo que ele ia sair gritando, ele não para, para o bolsemito. I thought, um, you thought it was all about um, going out there screaming, um, not him, to stop Bolsonaro, referring to the nickname of Bolsonaro, Feminazi, he calls him. You lost, um, you lost, you old sack. Broom's article describes the explosion of similar stories of psychoanalysts and, psych and psychologists on social media who have brought to the public, the public light these public, private conversations without revealing the identity of their clients that's, um, that, that they say point to the infiltration of hate in Brazilian society. <laughs> 
Brazilian um, um, President Bolsonaro popularly described um, by his opponents as a homophobic, misogynist, racist thing has embodied, has created an embodied fear and a kind of collective neurosis that have dominated conversations between psychologists and their patients. As Broom also reminds us in another essay she published in The Guardian recently, this is not simply paranoia. Bolsonaro has said in his own words that he is pro-torture and he would rather his son die than be gay and that under his leadership, um, he, would, he, he would make sure that there was no money for the NGOs and if it's up to me, he stated, every citizen would have a gun at home. Not one centimeter would be de will be demarcated for indigenous reserves or quilombolas or descendants of runaway enslaved communities. He vehemently supported the impeachment of the former president, Jilma Rousseff, the country's first female leader, and in, in which case I've argued elsewhere that misogynistic ideas about women's leadership were the root causes of her demise. He's unapologetic about his support for the incarceration of former President Lula, his defense of the military regime, and his investment in increased militarization of police forces throughout the country. What is most striking about these analyses of the fascist hatred on full display in Brazilian society is perhaps Broome's assertion that the president is, quote, the monstrous product of the country's silence about the crimes committed by its former dictatorship, unquote. This past week, Bolsonaro was criticized by journalists such as Broome, other activists and politicians alike, about his silence on the senseless murder of 51-year-old musician Evaldo Rosa dos Santos when army, police, um, army officers fired 80 times 80 tiros on his family's car in the Guadalupe neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro. His wife, 17, a seven-year-old son, friend of the family, and father-in-law were also in the car. While I agree that this silence on the country's violent past and present exists, black activists in Brazil have consistently stated that the violence of the military dictatorship between 1964 and 1980 represented one historical moment in the long durée of white supremacist colonial violence and the legacy of slavery. As Afro-Brazilian um, sociologist Vera Benedito, Benedita as, as, as publicly stated, how is it that Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery in 1888, but is still known as a racial paradise where everyone is partying and having sex with each other? Mm -hmm. Kristen Smith, Ana Flauzina, <laughs> Mao Chirio, Rebecca Atencio, mm -hmm. and numerous other scholars have documented that black, mm -hmm. brown, and poor people from the barracoons to the plantations to the quilombos to the favelas, bahios, have borne the brunt of the formulation of militarized policing, the development of techniques of surveillance and torture, and the state um, sponsorship of mass killings. It is impossible to main sl maintain slavery until 1888 without rampant sexual violence and a subsequent <coughs> system of racial apartheid that is always gendered and classed. So what Brazilian psychoanalysts and psychologists today have been calling the embodiment of hate the idea that millions of minds and bodies have been overcome with hate, anti-blackness, homophobia, misogyny, ousted Gilma Rousseff and voted for the current president had already been entrenched in the everyday, institution, um, everyday and institutional part of the lived experiences of Afro-Brazilians and indigenous peoples. Denise Ferreira da Silva has referred to this as the material consequence of gendered racial subjection built into the environment such as neighborhood segregation and even service and social elevators. The torture techniques of the military regime that the president refers to in Brazil and Chile had been perfected on the bodies of leftist activists such as Dilma Rousseff and the former Chilean president, Mich Mich uh, Michel Bachelet, and of course on the bodies of black and brown peoples who had always resisted the violence and marginalization for centuries since their kidnapping on the African coast and their resistance to slavery. An example that looks more hemispherically is Brazil's leading role in the installment of Mini, um, MINUNSTA, which is the United Nations Stab um, Stabilization Mission in Haiti, and militarized humanitarianism in Haiti, which Frank Mueller and Andrea Stank um, argue were actions directly related to Brazil's domestic expertise with urban, militarized urban policing. So if the supporters of Bolsonaro believe that every, every Brazilian should own, gu um, own guns, although um, almost 70% of Brazilians polled this week, and this is important, it's right after the killing of Evaldo, then black and, and, brown, um, black and brown poor people and women know precisely when, um, who and where will, um, will be their targets. The brutal killing of Capoeira Mestre Mo de Catan, um, Catende in Salvador in the hours after declaring he had voted for the Workers' Party candidate for, um, Fernando Haddad provided an example of what had already been, um, been the reality for most black people and the signification of what else was to come. Mm 
Evaldo's 29-year-old um, son, Daniel Hossa, was reported saying, President, um, President, no, President, President Jair Bolsonaro said the army was here to protect us, not take lives. And I would argue that the army was, is precisely its intent is to take lives. In mid-February, the Supreme Court denied the transfer of the case of nine military police officers on trial for the massacre in the Kabula neighborhood from Bahia to the federal court. Um, um, these police officers are in trial for killing 12 and seriously injuring another six men and women between the ages of 15 and 28 on February 15, 2015. Eight of the nine police officers continue to work on the streets. Um, July 2018 marked 25 years since the 1993 Candelaria massacre within, this, within the context, according to the, um, the federal police of Brazil, that between 1988 and 1991, 6,000 um, street children were killed mostly in Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo. On the night of, of her death, Maria Lefranco tweeted about the police murder of 23-year-old Mateus Melo de Castro in Rio, um, stating how many more must die for this war to end. And it's important um, to state that um, just 40, in just the month of March 2019, 43 um, police homicides were documented in um, São Paulo, for example. So activists of the Criola Black Women's Organization and the head of Human Rights Watch of Brazil um, well-known feminist um, Jurema Wernicke affirms that while most um, people have no memory of the military dictatorship, and the most offensive thing happened um, recently when on March 31st, um, Jair Bolsonaro tried to, um, um, to, come, um, come, um, to lead a commemoration of the 55 years of the military dictatorship. So while most young people have no memory of the military dictatorship, they're very familiar with the aftermath and many are still living in the senzalas that have existed adjacent, adjacent to the mansion since the slavery period. Mm -hmm. As one domestic worker and neighborhood activist I've worked with for decades stated in the aftermath of the presidential election, she said, um, she said um, I'll just read the translation, here in Salvador, it's terrible. A person um, talks about the workers' party, they get stabbed, it's horrible. In the days um, after the first round of the presidential elections, drawn consistently on the murder of Mestri, Katende, there was a genuine collective fear that this kind of political violence would become a trend um, that would connect to already existing violent patterns of gendered anti-blackness in the country. This violence is despite, is despite being a, a black majority and black um, culture such as samba, capoeira, fujada, um, etc., having been a central part of the construction of Brazilian identity and race and class-based affirmative action, having been codified in the Constitution. It has been reported that a black female professor in support of Haddad was sexually, who's the, um, the, the Workers' Party's, um, um, candidate, who was the Workers' Party's candidate for president, was sexually brutalized and, brutalized, and a corpse was placed outside the lecture of a black movement scholar activist. These kinds of violent political discourses and actions that have emerged in recent months align with the, with the very fact that every 23 minutes in Brazil, a young black person between the ages of 15 and 29 is killed. That is 63 per day, and in 2018, it was 23,100 black people. In, um, and between 1980 and 2014, during this democratic period, a record one million blacks have been killed. And between 2009 and 2013, the Brazilian um, police killed 11,196 um, recording the reason to be out of resistencia or resisting arrest and also to have been, been mistaken identity, such as in the case of Evaldo. Black men and women comprise 71% of the 318,000 homicides in Brazil between 2005 and 2015. And it's important for me, um, I won't get too much in the nitty gritty of the details of the numbers, but it's important for me to name these because these are also numbers that were on the rise during what was considered the social democratic period mm -hmm. of, um, of Lula and Jilma Rousseff. And uh, my primary argument is that that's the primary reason why um, they lack mass support on the part of the black population. <clears throat> so it should not be uh, read as a um, coincidence that the desire to arm the population, militarize urban neighborhoods, implement the death penalty legally, extrajudicially, um, as in the case of Evaldo shows, have appeared in the same political discourses as the urgent need to end affirmative action, eliminate the demarcation of Quilombo and indigenous lands, ban the teaching of gender in schools, eliminate all LGBTQ rights, and the, re and the recent removal of 4,000 Cuban doctors um, even before um, Bolsonaro's presidency began. So, the, um, so I would, um, my main argument 
is that um, they should all be read um, together as part of the, the general attack on the Social Democratic pro um, Project. So re to reinvigorate Paul, in uh, Paul Gilroy's mm -hmm. early ideas in There Ain't No Black in the Union, Jack, class becomes the lexicon through which race and gender to live. Anti-blackness and the sponsorship of, of, state vi of racial violence, this also includes austerity measures in the form of cuts to public health care and education, housing and cash benefits, which um, with the, the the Bolsa Familia, which is one of the major projects that was implemented under Lula and Gilma, is ever present without ever needing to utter any explicit ideas around race, gender, and blackness. The majority of poor people in Brazil are black, and the majority being criminalized and incarcerated are also black. The people in need of social order and control that the new government promises to, um, to, to implement are black and um, male and female. This is especially clear when we consider the, um, the the politicization of evangelical Christian and conservative Catholic movements that continue to demonize Afro-Brazilian religions, burn down and demolish tejeros, houses of worship, and I would also put this global in the context of the burning down of churches in the United States, that have strong female, I mean, in the context of Brazil, strong female, lesbian, and homosexual participation and leadership, as well as have generally and had more expansive de um, understandings of gender categories and practices of racial, gender, and class inclusion. And I would say that many have argued that these even, these uh, black women led tejeros are oftentimes the only places where people can find, um, know that there's some food security, right? That they can go um, they can find shelter as well as um, basic needs such as food. So the extension of social democratic rights to blacks, women, gays, and lesbians, and poor people over the last 15 years represent for the, um, the white elite, um, a threat to the racial, spatial, social order that the architects, these architects of Orden y Progreso, or Orden y Progreso, Order of Progress, have in mind. So even before the January 1st inauguration um, of Jaya Bolsonaro, the most important political project to be implemented as law had been one that evangelical and conservative Catholics, inspired by US, the US organization noindoctrination.org, have been pushing in recent years, which is the Escola Sin Partido, or the School Without Politics. The law will prohibit any sort of political ideology or doctrine in schools and universities, a kind of censorship unimaginable in any democratic society. And I want, as I'm saying this for you, to think about how it manifest in the United States. I, sometimes I feel like I'm repeating the same story of the United States. In addition to, um, to banning so-called Marxist indoctrination, the most important dimension of this law is, proposed, is the proposed ban on teaching about gender and sexuality. If you wondered why Judith Butler, author of the classic text, Gender Trouble, widely available in Portuguese, was so violently mm -hmm. attacked during her November 2000 visit to Brazil, <coughs> Then the political momentum of the anti-gender movement and the development of the Escola Sin Partido since the 1994 UN, UN, um, the, um, UNDP conference in Cairo and the 1995 UN Women Conference in Beijing may explain. The emergence of a gender of gen, um, the, the emergence of a discourse of gender to social, as a social construction and gender-specific rights and public policies strengthen an anti-gender movement in education. Right? Schools and universities have been seen as a battleground for maintaining a heteropatriarchy and Christian dominance. So what I'm suggesting is that it's the past at least 30 years where you've seen this, this real overemphasis on <coughs> um, undoing um, gender, um, any sort of gain in terms of gender rights. So some feminist activists have asserted that former President Gilmar Rousseff ceded to the pressure and refused to launch the Escola Sin Homophobia, which is a school without homophobia pedagogical materials, and her set, um, um, successor, Michelle Temer, removed all references to gender identity, sexual orientation, and teaching without prejudice from the National Common Core that had been taught since the 1990s. And Eliane Broom recently, I found a quote from an article she published today that said, um, in the discourse of hate and, and repression, um, repression against sexuality, um, had inf infiltrated to so the society in a way that even the left had begun to kind of consume um, that, that um, ideology. So the anti-gender movement had been pushing the idea of a moral education and Brazil for Brazilians to resemble America for Americans, which also has implications for the current required reading of Afro-Brazilian and indigenous history. 
In general, this represented a return to the romantic ideal of a Brazilian population that is white, heteropatriarchal, and where women and blacks and indigenous people know their place. Hence, for blacks, for black feminist activists, such as Jurema Vernecki, this political shift toward um, authoritarian rule is a, quote, coup against um, us, meaning black people, a coup against social rights. The election of Jair Bolsonaro's president is about putting back order in the big house, um, <laughs> rescuing whole hegemonies, and keeping the poor people in their rightful place. So as we documented in the report of the Latin American Studies fact-finding de delegation on the impeachment of, Brazil, um, of, of, of Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff, quote, social movement activists were perhaps less interested in the legal technicalities that legitimated this war against social equality. For them, the impeachment was about disputing and reclaiming power and keeping racial and class privilege intact. The impeached were, they felt, the poor people, the black people, gays and lesbians who have been the center of small victories gained in the last 13 years, unquote. Looks like I'm a little over time. The report provides rich documentation of the long, and I won't go into um, any more details around the report. It's available online. It's uh, the Latin American Studies report that documents really how we got to the point of the impeachment that allows you to understand what um, has happened since. Part of my argument is, has always been that if you look to Brazil, you can understand what has happened in the United States. Um, but certainly, um, you know, a lot of the, the social gains um, under uh, this, uh, within the, the framework of the social, de um, social democratic pro um, project of, of Lula and Dilma, uh, led to um, women such as Maria Lefranco being able to go to college and the, right, and the rise of the, in the number of college-educated blacks who are now shaping a new political class who are really questioning um, precisely why, I would argue, that this, um, that an anti-black genocide project has not been part of the social democratic project. So, um, so partly the, the argument is that um, even though the, the state itself um, understood the attack as being an intersectional attack on um, blacks in terms around race, class, gender, around against blacks, gays, um, lesbian, et cetera, that they saw that there needed to be a shift and a return back to a, a certain kind of um, society that is heteropatriarchal has, um, uh, and so forth, that feminists and student activists argued that the social democratic project failed precisely because it was not um, intersectional. Um, so a lot of my work has looked at how even grassroots activists have, um, have even analyzed and thought about their struggles over um, land and housing. Um, and I would say that for Brazil, as well as for the United States, and as we talk about Medicare for all, the next major, um, I think hopefully the shift in the United States is gonna be um, not just, how, um, not just um, affordable housing, um, or rent reform, or et cetera, but certainly social housing, or some sort of really um, um, uh, of housing for all sort of narrative that we see is, is much more popular now with healthcare. Um, so I'll just I'll just end and say that you know I'm not one of those people who write papers just for the conference and say look write 10 pages. I'm always like no, I need to write the whole thing because I won't finish it. Um, so I would say that 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 partly um, the anti-black genocide movement. Um, and I'll just end here and say, has gained momentum in Brazil, especially in the last, um, in the, in the di days following the, the, the violent chokehold of 19-year-old of um, Pedro, um, Pedro Gonzaga at the Rio market on, on February. And despite the centuries-old plan to eliminate enemies within, and I'm, I'm, what I'm always emphasizing is that the enemies within um, that have been attacked in terms of these so-called the leftist activists, the communists that Bolsonaro says needed to, you know, that the, the, the military regime eliminated, that the enemies within are always um, the leftist activists, the student activists, that are, um, blacks, gays, indigenous people who are pushing and, um, for an expansion of democracy um, and, and the, even the definition and practice of the democracy. So I, I understand the role of scholars um, and professors to be even more urgent. Um, and I understand in looking at the Brazilian case, the classroom as being ground zero for training new generations of thinkers and doers who envision a democratic society that contemplates um, all of us. And I'll end there. Okay. <clears throat>
three very serious papers. <laughs> uh, to, to I mean, very serious. And, um, and so uh, since we started about 10 minutes uh, after the original time, I think it to kind of do justice, but also in the context of the bringing the uh, day's activities together, uh, really taking 10 to uh, 15 minutes for question and answer. And then um, if maybe we could take two questions at the, uh, t uh, two questions and then, uh, and then the panelists can answer just in terms of clusters. So whomever would like to, uh, yeah. Uh, papers. I've got a uh, question for uh, Dr. Comperi and for Dr. Balfour. Um, I think in terms of Keisha's paper, one of the things that I think are implicit in your paper is about a more abstract relationship between fascism and racial rule, particularly the ways in which you talk about the continuous violence across a variety of different regime um, types. And so I'm wondering then, you know, how you think um, your work may fit, because I, one of the Baldwin specialists can help me out here, but there was an essay uh, where Baldwin at one point, I believe, mentions fascism as something that happens to white people, and there's a way in which if you think about, you know, people like Enzo Traverso's work on Nazi violence, or um, Karl Korsch, the Viennese Marxist, there are ways in which we can sort of link up, because in some sense what you're suggesting is what's, what's going on now is not, is not new, and the kind of periodizations offered to divide up Brazilian politics don't really apply, or they have their limitations in applying to Afro-Brazilian state, state repression against Afro-Brazilians. Um, for Lori, um, I got a question, if you could elaborate more about Mo Morrison's idea of sovereignty, and just, I'm still trying to get a sense of how you delink sovereignty or concept of sovereignty from its monarchical and Westphalian geopolitical moorings. Um, that's it. Is there anyone else? Maybe let's start with, with those. yeah. Um, thank you so much, Professor Henshaw. Um I think that partly what um, I've learned over the years, and I've seen this manifested more recently in, in all of the discussion around uh, fascism in Brazil, is even when they're not talking about black people i mean it's 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 there right it's like who who is it, who is this are, who is this kind of fascist um what's who, what um, where, um who's this being carried out against right so when you say you know everyone needs to carry a gun or we need to kill all the bandidos i mean evaldo is is one of said bandido right we i support extrajudicial killing that justice must you know is is carried out even before asking a question about whether or not you're the actual criminal so there's all of this so partly what i'm suggesting and around language is that even without you having to say black poor gay lesbian is that they're they're seen you know it's it's already already understood and explicit and um and, and i really have been thinking a lot about what it means to have fascism on the rise in a predominantly black context and i think this is one of the the best examples of this um, taking place right now and how it impacts um, um black movements what i find really fascinating about the the interviews that we did in brazil is that one, is that everyone, and I didn't get a chance to mention this in this paper and it's there, but everyone mentioned affirmative action as being, the struggle of affirmative action as being the, the, the point, including all the white folks we interviewed who said, when he said, what do you think was the breaking point for Brazilian society? Affirmative action, mm -hmm. right? And it's, that, it's the one space, so when people say we can do, we can do Bolsa Familia, Bolsa Familia is the cash grants that everybody's celebrating globally as a, how successful this is. Cash grants is a small fee that you get and then you have to send your children to school and you have to get, um, um, and it's part of the public health system. So the, the expansion of public health care, the expansion of public universities, the expansion of this, you know, um, of these, what they call the, actually they say it was just a, it was just a small, grant every month to families, but when you said affirmative action, which is the one space where you would have to include the black population in a very serious way that challenged ideologically though the social order of, of Brazil, um, challenge the very premise of the racial democratic, um, racial democracy as a project, is where everyone said no, including folks on the left, right? No, that's not, that's where we draw the line. Right, so it gives up white privilege even for folks, even um, for white folks. Right, so I think 
So I think that's where you see um, where people said the, that there, there was a little, and, and around homophobia, right? And I think, so I think those are the two, the two issues. And then I think the other one was the, the Bello Monchi Dam, which meant that the construction of the Bello Monchi Dam and people believing that there was no sense of allegiance to indigenous right, land rights um, and it was a mass dam project that was gonna displace and flood and destroy so many indigenous communities. So that was another one, so affirmative action, the construction of the Bella Monchi Dam, and no state response to anti-black violence, which meant that because they, they, were killing, they were killing black youth at such a rate, and for the state to not say anything. So this, the, the kind of silence that one sees from, from Bolsonaro is that a lot of activists will say, we also saw that on the left. So, I, you know, so Jurema Verneke, for example, and Suli Carnero, who you're familiar with, they say, I'm not of the right on the left, I'm black, right? So part of the <laughs> argument is that, so when Jilma said, well, you know, there was no mass movements, you know, to make sure I wasn't impeached and so forth, you know, they're like, no, it was very hard psychologically mm -hmm for the mm -hmm. masses of indigenous and black folks to actually take to the street to support mm -hmm. the left, right? So I would say that the, the, the fascism, that, that, that moment, and I think another key point that, was, that came out of the, the research um, on the impeachment is, um, is that um, mm -hmm. the evangelicals did such a good job of at grassroots organizing, <laughs> right? That they were doing door-to-door -door mm -hmm. activism <laughs> to, say, to tell the truth in a way that leftist activists had actually been integrated into the state, mm -hmm. right? So what they say is that the ideological work that needs to be done in university classrooms at the grassroots neighborhood levels had stopped, and, and that was a nice way, segue, for churches to really take over and allow for all of the anti-gender, mm -hmm. anti, um, all the homophobic sentiments to take root, all the anti-black sentiments and anti-Afro-Brazilian sentiments to take root that would allow for uh, a Bolsonaro to, uh, to emerge, right? Mm. So I'll, this, I had a long response, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, so th thank you for the, the question, sort of, you know, what does an idea of sovereignty look like that is not trapped in a kind of Westphalian idea? Well, I should say the longer version of this chapter, um, I talk not only about sovereignty, but also territory, which is another one of her terms. So I go all the way. Um, and she uses that um, very extensively, especially, for instance, thinking about her debts to Baldwin. And she talks about Baldwin as going into enemy territory. and, and um, and the ways in which she uses this language of um, expansion and conquest, but without trying to imagine what it would look like without the, um, the idea of conquest driving it. Um, and I think there are kind of maybe three answers to your question. I mean, first is, um, it's not to displace the critiques of sovereignty. I mean, that's very much part of, you know, part of her project, uh, both the idea of individual sovereignty and also the the idea of state sovereignty. I mean, Morrison is very adamant that she doesn't see herself as a citizen. It's not a, you know, it's not a, a critical concept for her. And I think where I wanted to, to draw some positive connections is to think about multiple forms of sovereignty, which puts her in dialogue with indigenous thinkers and activists who are thinking about um, sovereignty claims that uh, may be based around alternative relationships to land and to community. Uh, I'm not equating them, but one of the things that I think is so powerful about her work is even as she understands this idea of t territory as being important, she's always very conscious of the kinds of usurpation that may even be built into black freedom dreams in the U.S. And so, so the first is a multi, you know, sort of the multiplicity. The second is because of the way she sees um, the practice of, of fiction writing as being engaged in what she calls um, complicity or conspiracy, there's always a relinquishment of, um, of power or control. Or so. Although I've had people, when I've said this, they've said, I don't know, it's like I was reading a Morrison novel and I didn't feel like she was giving up any power or control, like I was struggling <laughs> to, so. But I think she, this is how she understands I mean, she's got this really extraordinary way of thinking about, to go back to this morning's discussions and thinking about Yasmin's paper, about sort of um, the, the no place or the other place that um, she wants the reader to meet her there because it won't do any work just if she puts it in a book. And the final thing is that the quest for sovereignty for her is always a failed 
quest, even though she's perpetually re-engaging it. So it's always, it's always futile. She, she calls it a willed illusion, a way of trying to exercise a certain kind of authority or control in a world in which that is not only impossible, but also um, generally violent. Um, but that, that that aspiration is part of how she um, continues to try to make sense of the world that she's part of. I want to just jump in with the uh, moderator's prerogative for a moment. Um, because, uh, and this question is for John Drabinsky, but in relation to the other two papers, especially Keisha Khan Perry's, because after that last presentation, given the discourse on pessimism that came up earlier, it almost seems like when I heard this, I was like, oh my goodness, the Afro pessimists in the, in the orbit may say, this is the, what, all, what you were telling us, the long, if I understand, the long durée, right, of anti blackness. Right, you, were you, you were pushing us against to just think of a periodization of is it just now or was it five years ago, but that there's this long durée. Uh, and so, uh, but John, you were posing what I was hoping you could say a little bit more about was not only notions of pessimism, Afro-pessimism and otherwise, but uh, queer optimism. And so I would love to hear more in terms of, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be applying to the case of Brazil, but uh, a little more in terms of that idea of queer, uh, of queer optimism and how that relates to belonging, particularly when um, for many people there are real reasons to um, question whether or not belonging is ever going to be a uh, kind of a, re a reality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> so the, you know, I didn't, yeah. um, oh, did you want no, to? No, 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 please. Um, oh, I forgot I was supposed yeah. to talk into the microphone. Um, I, I mean, I take that, uh, that phrase, queer optimism, from uh, the book by the same title, uh, Michael Snedeker, which is, which is moving. It's not a, not a sort of Africana studies book. Right, it's, right, it's right. It's a sexuality studies book um, and tied to poetry. So it's a, but the conceptual thing that I find interesting is, is him, his shift from the sort of terms of pessimism which are about the, you know, the violence of any effort towards inclusion or belonging or participation in a multiracial space, for him, a sort of uh, multi-sexual space. Um, and thinking about, you know, the, uh, what he calls this, the fiat of happiness, you know, the fiat of pleasure, and that that's, um, that that's the sort of thing that is, it's, uh, it's a world, it's not an escape. And so for me, that's an interesting way of thinking about the, you know, what the Afro-pessimists do um, is they, you know, <laughs> they burden you with the task of proving mm -hmm. that <laughs> in a necropolitical order there could be any hope, mm -hmm. right? But part of what I think is interesting about, you know, this, I know it's a, a sort of bricolage approach to the, to the topic, but this cluster of thinkers is there's this element in the African-American tradition, which I think is very different than, say, you know, Césaire or Fanon at the, around the same moment in the Caribbean. But this idea of their, um, you know, that, that, that concedes too much. Right, that, that, that somehow that, that ontology of the white world is the world. Right? And thinking about you know what worlds exist as Baldwin's phrase, the relation Negroes bear to one another. I mean, I, that phrase is basically you know in everything I've written on Baldwin. I think it's really important. And for me, sort of queer optimism. You know, he he mentions optimism famously. I'm an optimist because I live. Or I don't find that very helpful. But um, I think queer optimism is a way of talking about you know uh, you know talking about an intervention in the Afro-pessimist conversation that doesn't operate inside this comprehensive ontology, right? Mm -hmm. That, the, you know, to think about worlds that are outside the white gaze, right? Which is not to fantasize a world, but is to think about a tradition as an actual tradition, right? That is something that has a world built into itself. You know, that's the spirituals, the blues, jazz, soul, Hip hop, this sort of continuity um, that Gilroy talks about, or that Du Bois sort of suggests. Um, for me, this is a, a, a site in that tradition of an optimism that isn't an intervention in the pessimistic world, right? But is instead um, a reminder 
um, as Baldwin always says, you know, that, that this space is my home with everything that comes with that. Um, and, you know, that Bessie Smith is the thing he takes along with his typewriter abroad, to me, is really important, right? That there's a, a you know, Bessie Smith sings about home. Home where? On the flooded Mississippi Delta. I mean, the most abject moment of the 1920s. Um, and so, for me, that, that I, you know, I take Michael's idea of, the, of queer optimism just to talk about, like, a, a getting outside the, the hegemony of, of a notion of a shared world and the kind of ontology determined by the white gaze or the colonial order to think about the, the not just the possibility but the actuality for centuries of alternative spaces in which happiness is not just fiat, it's, it's a life world. Yeah. We have, I guess time for either one more question or I saw there were two hands so maybe if it's... It, like Angelica is behind the pillar. Oh, behind, so I guess <laughs> just a final cluster of questions if that's okay. Um, and then we can continue after those um, <laughs> informally. Um, yes, I just wanted to, to also um, ask you about or to ruminate on. Um, can you speak louder? Yes, uh, <laughs> I <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about or, or ask you to ruminate further on this idea of world building, um, and I find it so interesting um, and so pr appropriate. Uh, that world building would be the sort of answer to the, the um, foreclosure of Afro-pessimism mm -hmm. because world building is central to geek culture, which is the center of Afrofuturism. Uh, so um, thinking about world hmm. building as a political theoretic notion mm -hmm. is super exciting to mm -hmm. me. Um, and um, I don't know, I guess I just w want to <laughs> hear more uh, about it as not, um, you know, of, of how we can conceive of it. Thank you so much. I, I just have a, a, a kind of a two-spirit question. Thank you so much for those wonderful talks. Um, regarding Bolsonaro, I, I was wondering if um, you can offer us a, a, a why for all of the support of this man by um, Brazilian footballers, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho, um, and the such. And if there's, there's some type of... Um, we see in the U.S., particularly in the NBA, which is an organization that is run and dominated by uh, young black men, really it's the sport that has stood up the most towards the Bush administration, I'm sorry, the Trump administration. But with Bolsonaro coming, <laughs> going through his campaign, we surprisingly saw whether it was Gabriel Jesus, Ronaldinho, Rivaldo, so many players came out um, backing this man, which from American eyes in one way would make sense, but in one way would seem surprising, I would think. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, 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 on that. Um, and regarding Morrison and language, I was just wondering if Morrison's work as an editor plays out at all in this sense of language. In other words, how does Toni Morrison speak to us regarding these terms when she's not speaking as an author, but as an editor? Particularly since African American literature, um, at its heart, has worked, I think, particularly in its ontology, to blur this, this distinction between writer, right? writing agent, and maker of epistemologies. So um, thank you. Thank you, the three of you, and thank you, Neil. And that was all. I think maybe those, I know there were other kind of hands, but probably for time, maybe take those and we can carry the other ones into <laughs> Some tough questions. Um, I just wanted to touch on the, the, the question around Afro-pessimism. I think, I didn't get a <laughs> chance to, to mention this, but I think um, Erica Malunguinho, who was the first uh, trans politician to be elected to the state senate in Sao Paulo, um, offered um, kind of reflection around what the future kind of, you know, would look like. And I think a lot of her analysis was around really tying um, the, uh, um, the, the death of trans uh, men and women and, um, um, and black and, uh, men and women in Brazil as, and seeing it as part of a, a much kind of global project. And I think part of what 
I end up kind of wanting to argue is that um, is the, the point that black life requires, we, we, we stated in, the, in the, the statement that we wrote as a collective with Kristen Smith and Tiana Pachel, mm -hmm. um, et, et cetera, that the fight for black life requires us to remain vigilant at home and abroad, and that the, the expansion of this um, social democratic pro um, project and how we understand it would have to be um, both uh, feminist but also intersectional as well as transnational. So I think partly this, this pest, I think part of this, this hope is once we start to look beyond what we are familiar with and then we look to kind of African descendant communities um, elsewhere and I think that's really important. It's a global project and I think this, the world building that you mentioned, Eva, I think um, a lot of us have been talking about kind of a diasporic consciousness. I think there's often times where we get wrapped up within the confines of the United States as offering the only possibilities, but what happens when we start to look beyond in terms of as a, as a diaspora and what the struggle would look like, but also what the, the world would, what the, the new world would look like diasporically. So I think I appreciate that. Um, the, the, the question around uh, black soccer players um, is really, I think, can go back to the question about black police officers, um, I think is, 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 I think, I don't know if necessarily they're unrelated. Um, and I think partly Kristen Smith's um, um, response would be for us to think about how white supremacy, in the same way that women perform patriarchy and carry out patriarchy, um, I think there's a way that you have to think about kind of how we can embody and, and perform um, um, inequality without having to be, um, to be to to have that that body right so I think that's really important but I think um, partly goes back to the the other part of my the the essay around how the ideological work that's done I mean I think affirmative action was so crucial and in entering the university um, in terms of access to knowledge around diaspora around black thought around um, literature. Um, for how uh, consciousness raising takes place in terms of tr and thinking about and transforming society. What happens? And I think the ideological work that was taking place um, really explains these soccer players, right? I mean, who they are um, and the lack of thought, I mean, in terms of vision and, and anti-racist critique. I don't think it's necessarily um, um, by accident, right? And the same way that the majority of Brazilians that I've encountered, and it's not by accident, they also mostly live abroad, right? Um, but in the same way that most of the Brazilians I encounter in the United States, especially in the Massachusetts area, all support Bolsonaro, right? But I think the collective imagination of that the enemies are the black people who are not allowed. So for example, you hear people say, when, when I go home to Brazil, I can't flash my money, I can't do this, I can't do, I mean, there's a, there's a and who the connective kind of criminal and enemy within the state is, the black people, the poor people, the, the gays, the lesbians, who are really causing all this trouble, who are really pushing the boundaries of saying, look, we want some of that money, we want some of that pie, we want, we want democracy, we want access to these resources, right? So I think, I mean, there's so many ways that I could answer that question, and, and, and but I think the, the point around the lack of grassroots ideological work, the, the education that needed to take place over the last 15 years is really important. I think only I can say the spaces that it was taking place is um, that I've documented are the landless, the, the housing movements, the, the houseless movements, is where that political move, that political work, intellectual work was taking place. But otherwise, it wasn't taking place necessarily in the school when there's an attack of what is being taught in school, right? As well as the lack of access to public education in the first place. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say that the the kind of political consciousness that one would hope for. I mean, anyway, I could keep going on about uh, uh, Neymar at all, and um, you know, I think the the answer that Brazilians would say is that são todos ridículos. So, on that note. <laughs> Oh, um, and for now, it probably offers a good response to all of them, so I won't, I won't go in there. So, so quickly, I mean, it's a great question about Morrison's experience as an editor. I think two quick things um, come to mind. First, you know, she, when she talks about her years as an editor, she talks about, I mean, it is a world-making project. It's creating a body of literature that was not in circulation, um, whether it be you know, Lucille Clifton's poetry or Tony, Tony Cade Bambara's uh, novels or Angela Davis's autobiography, you know, so that there's a way in which, um, you know, there's an extension, I think, from what she does as an editor to um, when she talks about writing books she wanted to be able to read, that, that both that practice is, is precisely about putting that 
out in the world. I mean, she's so, I think, good on the question of cannon building, and she talks about, um, about how to have cannons without enshrining them, like how to enhance, and, and so that that's a piece of it. The other piece is, um, I think I've been struck, and I haven't had time really to think about this yet, but her new book mm -hmm. is, w one of the things that's so extraordinary is how it's put together. So how the pieces are put together. So the piece I, I mentioned, Peril, is a preface, and then the first section, The Foreigner's Home, where this theme that has become more and more pronounced in her work about the movement of people, and you know, this is something that came up earlier, and the control of you know, both forced migrations and thwarted migrations um, and powerlessness being reinforced by, um, by control of, of, of mass movements that she sees having their origins um, in the slave trade. Um, one of the things about that book that is so stunning is, um, is it's um, the craft of how the pieces are set side by side and how they're combined together in, and that's a way in which I think, um, you know, you can see her long experience as an editor and she's now, I don't know anything about the production of this book, but it feels as though she is her own editor in a different way than in, in her previous work. And then the last thing I will say is one of the things about Morrison as an editor is I think this also accounts for the, the dissatisfaction, um, the, the continual investment in and passion about words and yet knowing that there is always, there, you know, that, that, that the word doesn't do all of the work because she can't escape ultimately the larger structure and history that it comes comes out of. So it produces something new, but it is still attached to that world that she can't fully wish away. Yeah. So um, quickly, thank you for your comment. Um, I would actually turn to an example, I forget if it was in your paper in the, the conversation of um, uh, the, um, remind me where it was, the, the uh, the, that redid that that refurbished the houses yeah. and gave them um, in Louisville. Um, that to me is a really interesting example because I mean it's a concrete example, and so I don't mean to be all sort of figurative about it. I know it's a material moment, but you know there are a few ways of thinking about you know taking a, a an abandoned home, renovating it, and giving it to a, a single black mother. Right. For me, there are like a few ways of thinking about that, right? There's the Afro pessimist, like the real Afro pessimist that mm. Neil spent some time with a couple of weeks ago with me. Um, would say, you know, well, the abandoned house is part of this like mm -hmm. post apocalyptic uh, racial landscape, mm -hmm. right? And so there's, it's, it's sort of like watching uh, Terminator in the future, you know, when they're like walking among the ruins, and, and who thinks that this is like a life? Right. I mean, I think the Afro pessimist sort of sees that as a moment of just making do with abjection. Right. I think the other is to think about um, to think about it as a kind of neoliberal hustle. Right. I mean, I don't know that Lester Spence would put it, it would would interpret it that way, but his book, I think, really mm -hmm. would see it as a kind of neoliberal hustle. The state doesn't protect, hmm. doesn't caretake. Right. And so it just leaves it up to people. But for me, what's interesting about this world making, uh, you know, what I think is important about that notion of world making is it actually suspends the very terms of those two characterizations. Those terms are the imperative of a shared world or an ontology of a shared world. And instead just says, we have our own world, right? We make, we've made homes out of broken pieces for centuries, right? And that, that's a world unto itself. Are there, are there questions about a sort of multiracial democratic space? Absolutely, <coughs> but you can interpret that moment as, as a neoliberal hustle or as a post-apocalyptic landscape alone, right? That cannot be the only characterization, maybe uh, I would say shouldn't be the leading characterization, but instead to see it as, as community work, uh, uh, community work that in some ways manifests materially all these things that come from the African-American tradition, and I would say the Creolist dimension of the Caribbean tradition, right? To think about making, uh, making worlds out of remainders and fragments. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that, to me, is not abject work. For Césaire and Fanon, that was abject work. That's why the Afro-pessimists love those guys. I know you like Fanon. I, I think Fanon's a really problematic figure for that reason. But so for me, like, that when I heard that example, I thought if I could pause time, I would rewrite this paper around that example because to me, it's not only like, a, I mean, it's, the bottom line is beautiful material work of care, right? But it also in that way is an instance of the profundity mm -hmm. of thinking outside mm -hmm. that shared world and the kind of perils of <coughs> ontology, right? Uh, that limits itself to a one world. On that note. Thanks to our, um, help me joining, thanking our panel.